Tonight, breaking news just coming in. The deadly Black Hawk helicopter crash in Alabama. Surveillance video, look closely, appearing to show the chopper falling out of the sky. First responders rushing to the scene of the fiery wreck. What we're learning about who was on board. Also tonight, the dramatic moment in a New York courtroom. A family member lunging at the man who killed his sister and nine others at a Buffalo supermarket last spring. The moment of rage coming hour after hours of emotional testimony, the powerful messages from the families of the 10 victims, and how much their killer will spend behind bars. Interrogating Murdoch, the never before seen interview with the man accused of murdering his wife and son, how he reacted when he learned that he was the primary suspect in the case, and the major hold detectives poked in his alibi. The exclusive NBC News interview tonight, the defense secretary speaking for the first time about those mysterious flying objects that were shot down by the military. What he said about the threat those objects posed to American citizens and why the military may have failed to detect similar objects in the past. Protesters taking to the streets in Florida, furious at Governor Ron DeSantis and his Stop Woke Act. How a banned AP class is reigniting the debate over what is taught in schools and the book you may have read growing up that now has parents up in arms. Plus the outrageous images from a daycare in Miami showing toddlers in blackface. How their teacher is explaining the shocking incident. And Ozempic confessions. You've likely heard about this injection billed as a weight loss wonder drug. But tonight, three women share their stories going on and then off the medication, how the drug worked, what side effects they felt, and what you need to know if you're considering getting a prescription. Top story starts right now. And good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news. A Black Hawk helicopter has crashed in Madison County, Alabama, near Huntsville. A home security camera appearing to capture the moment you could see it on the far right of your screen falling out of the sky. The chopper simply falling right out of the sky. A massive plume of smoke then erupting from the site. Officials confirming there were no survivors on board. No one on the ground that we know of right now was hurt. I want to get right to NBC's Dan DeLuce at the Pentagon with this late breaking details. Dan, what can you tell us? Unfortunately, we don't know more than it was a UH-60 Blackhawk that went down near Huntsville. It was a National Guard helicopter, but we don't know why it went down, whether it was mechanical or weather related. But we do know that both of those crew members, unfortunately, died in that crash. And Dana, of course, emergency crews responding to the scene, as we know right now from initial reports, it sounds like nobody on the ground was hurt. That's right. There are no reports that there are other casualties beyond the crew members and also this extraordinary footage captured by that doorbell camera. OK, Dan, we appreciate reporting. We'll stay on top of the story throughout the broadcast as more images are there just coming in. OK, we turn now to emotions running high in a New York courtroom today as the man responsible for a hate filled, deadly rampage at a Buffalo supermarket last May learned his fate. The relative of one of his victims lunging towards the gunman who pled guilty to 10 counts of murder last year. Police restraining the man as the murderer was escorted out of the courtroom for a brief time. That man, the brother of 72-year-old Catherine Massey, who was one of 10 black victims shot and killed at a top supermarket last May. Their family still grieving the loss of their loving mothers and fathers, grandfathers and grandmothers and siblings. A small solace, the judge today handing down 10 consecutive life sentences to that gunman. NBC's Rahema Ellis has more on the powerful messages delivered today in court. My brother was one of the victims of this senseless massacre. In the courtroom, victims' families facing down a convicted racist gunman, showing grace. Do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. But also pain. You have shattered a lot of lives here, sir. Thank y'all for protecting There was anger. I will hurt you so bad. And rage too overwhelming to bear. This was the moment the sister of 72 year old Catherine Massey got up to speak. You don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhood to take people out. Don't do it. Her brother charged at the gunman. Guards quickly subdued him, while Peyton Gendron was ushered out of the courtroom for a few minutes. Massey was a woman devoted to family and community. She wrote about the need for gun safety one year before her own life was stolen by gun violence. 
Gendron, the white supremacist gunman, was convicted of killing 10 people in a hate crime targeting African Americans in a Buffalo supermarket. Today, he apologized. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. The judge was not moved. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. All right, Rahema Ellis joins us now live in studio tonight. Rahema, there were a lot of emotional moments in court. We clearly saw when one of the, the relatives there got, got aggressive and tried to go after the killer. Did the family think this was justice with, with 10 consecutive counts, life sentences? It was the most that they could get. And so with that, I think there was some sense that they were feeling justice. But today, as you point out, they were feeling so much. They weren't looking past their pain today. They were feeling it. And it burst over. It burst out among so many people. There were those who expressed a sense of they didn't want this person to see the death penalty or to get the death penalty. And they did say I, they didn't feel that some people said they didn't feel that they could hate this person for the rest of their life. One woman saying to hate him would be too much of a burden for her to carry around. So she wouldn't do that. But others were just so angry about what they've lost. And that Clearly. is their loved ones. Yeah. Rahema. Rahema Alice, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. We turn now to the dramatic developments in the trial of Alex Murdoch. Prosecutors showing video of a police interrogation. It's the moment Murdoch realizes he's the only suspect in the murder of his wife and son. Katie Beck is covering the trial for us tonight. On Wednesday, jurors watch the dramatic moment Alec Murdoch first learns he's the only known suspect in his wife and son's murders. Did you kill Maggie? No. Did I kill my wife? Yes, sir. Not a baby. Do you know who did? No, I do not know who did. Did you kill Paul? No, I did not kill Paul. Do you know who did? No, sir, I do not know who did. The interview with a SLED investigator took place at a SLED office two months after the murders. Investigators informed Murdoch they believe guns owned by the family were used to commit the murders. Murdoch offers no visible response. Murdoch also confronted about his alibi story, whether he was in or near the crime scene after dinner, which he again denies. At 9 o'clock? Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if my times are right. Also on tape, emotional moments as Murdoch asks for details about whether his wife and son suffered and who was killed first. Did you know one of them live after they were shot first? No. Not long. Miss Evans. The shooting happened very quickly. Very quickly. Is this one person, two persons, three persons? On cross, the defense attacking points made in the video, calling out missteps in the investigation, such as no DNA tests done on Maggie and Paul's clothing. That Murdoch's mother's house where he went that night wasn't searched by police for weapons or evidence until three months after the crime. Would you agree that was an opportunity missed? For Almeida, yes. And the admission that investigators used deception tactics on Murdoch in the voluntary August interview, even giving misstatements to the grand jury that indicted him. I'm allowed to use trickery to elicit a response. Yes. Okay. And you're allowed to do it, and you did it. Yes. SLED investigators say Murdoch's inconsistent statements about his alibi put him at the center of their case. They had no other credible leads. Do you think I killed Maggie? I have to go where the evidence and the fact are. Inside the courtroom, tensions between the state and defense attorneys reaching a high point in the trial so far. Prosecutors say they plan to wrap their case sometime on Thursday. The defense eager to present their first witness on Friday. Tom? Okay, Katie Beck for us at that trial. New details on the deadly shooting at Michigan State University that has left three people dead and five injured. Earlier today, students returned to campus to pick up the items they left as the shots rang out. And now we're learning of the first possible clue into a motive. Here's NBC's Maggie Vespa. 
Tonight, amid devastating loss, students at Michigan State University returning to the student union for the first time. Escorted by the FBI, they recover belongings left as they ran for their lives Monday night when a lone gunman terrorized campus, oh claiming God. three lives. Were things left there like as they were that night? Yeah, my bag and my coat right here were exactly where they left it, and all my friend's stuff was exactly where they left it, too. This as tributes pour in for the eight victims, five still in critical condition, and three killed. Ariel Anderson, who dreamed of becoming a surgeon, Brian Frazier, chapter president of his fraternity, and Alex Verner, a high school athlete known for her kindness. <laughs> And new tonight, a possible lead on motive and what may have prompted the alleged shooter, 43-year-old Anthony McRae, who investigators say took his own life after the rampage to target MSU. It's being investigated that he may have applied for a position here. Yes, we're trying to establish any potential connectivity. Can you tell us how that came to light? How just part of the investigation itself. Also part of that investigation, how he obtained the gun, as well as McRae's criminal background, including a guilty plea to a misdemeanor weapons charge in 2019. I want an education. Meanwhile, miles away at Michigan State's capital, pain turning to anger. Students demanding stricter gun laws and background checks. When is enough enough? On campus, the fear palpable. Someone spray painting a rock, allow us to defend ourselves and carry on campus. Students today painting back over it, honoring the classmates they lost. Wow, the gun debate happening right there on campus. Maggie Vespa joins us now from one of the vigils in East Lansing, Michigan. Maggie, give us a sense of, of the community there. We saw a lot of that raw emotion in your piece. Do we know when classes are going to resume and, and are students there ready for that yet? Uh, based on what we're seeing tonight, Tom, I, I would be shocked if they're ready for it in the immediate future. Right now, the school is planning to cancel classes through this week, so it sounds like Monday at the earliest. But yeah, this is the latest vigil that's taken place here on campus. It's just clearing out now easily hundreds, if not a thousand people coming here to mourn this after that impassioned rally that you saw at the state capitol earlier today. Tom. Okay, Maggie Vespa with a lot of new developments in that campus shooting. Tonight, we're also tracking a severe storm threat from the Gulf Coast to the Great Lakes that has popped up. Take a look at this. More than 100 cars stranded overnight on Interstate 94 in Minnesota and North Dakota as heavy snow fell across the region. The system also bringing potentially dangerous winds across the south. 14 million people now at risk for severe thunderstorms, hail, and possible tornadoes. So let's get right to Bill Karens, who's timing it all out for us. Bill, we thought we were going to be talking to you later in the week, but now this tornado threat has us wanting to know what's going on out there. Yeah, it's tonight and then tomorrow afternoon. That's the chance if we're going to get any strong tornadoes, and hopefully they'll miss town towns and populated areas. Hopefully they'll be over forests or maybe a farmer's field and that'll be it. But we'll find out in the next 24 hours. So t we have a severe thunderstorm watch for Dallas, Fort Worth and McAllister. Large hail is possible, like two inch size hail. So that's like windshield smashing hail is possible in the next <coughs> couple hours. We will see eventually here a tornado watch issued for areas of Louisiana, Arkansas, up to Memphis and Greenville, Mississippi. That'll be coming out in the next couple hours. The timing for the tornado threat appears to be about eight to nine o'clock to probably about one or two in the morning. So we're talking not Nocturnal after sunset, a very dangerous. Storm chasers can't see them. And that's this area in here, Little Rock to Memphis to Greenwood, and maybe even northern Louisiana. But this is the area that the Storm Prediction Center is targeting for the chance of not just a tornado, but one or two strong tornadoes, the ones that would tear apart houses or towns if they happen to hit those areas. So that's you from Greenville to Memphis. So as you go to bed tonight, make sure you have your family plans in case those tornado sirens start going off. And then tomorrow, you mentioned it, from the Gulf Coast all the way up to the Ohio Valley, Severe weather threat, but once again, Alabama, Mississippi, tornado threat for you. Okay, Bill, we thank you for that update. We turn now to the latest on the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. It's been one week since an evacuation order was lifted, but as we've reported, residents are worried about what may be lingering in the air, water and soil. Officials telling them to drink bottled water, and now the state's governor pressed about what he would do if he actually lived there. Ron Allen has the details. Tonight, outrage growing, less than two weeks after that massive train derailment and the controlled burn of hazardous chemicals sent up a toxic plume of black smoke in East Palestine, Ohio. It doesn't smell safe that I'm taking my things and I'm out of here. Residents demanding answers, complaining of burning eyes, nausea, headaches, and a pungent odor, and reporting dead animals. 
Officials confirming 3,500 fish killed by the chemicals. Don't tell me it's safe. Something's going on if the fish are floating in the creek. State officials now suggest drinking bottled water after telling evacuated residents it was safe to return home. The governor, who approved that controlled burn of toxic chemicals to prevent an explosion, was asked if he'd return home if he lived near the crash site, where crews now work to remove soil and wreckage possibly contaminated by chemicals like vinyl chloride, suspected of causing cancer. I think that I would be drinking the bottled water um, and I would be continuing to uh, um, find out what the tests were showing as far as the air. Um, I would be alert and, and concerned, but uh, I think I would probably be back in my house. Again today, officials saying constant tests and monitoring of the air and water show the environment is safe. We understand uh, some of the anxiety of the community. We're going to be here until this problem is cleaned up. I'm not believing those reassurances yet. Why not? I need proof. Janet Hill, a breast cancer survivor, says she has a constant cough and sore throat and worries about her firefighter son, who spent days working the crash site. I worry what's going to happen 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Okay, Ron Allen joins us again live here on Top Story. Ron, we were on this earlier this week. You mentioned those lawsuits some residents are going to file, but now they're going to have a chance to voice their frustration in person? Yes, there's an information meeting, town hall meeting tonight, where residents get their first face-to-face -face opportunity to confront local officials about what's going on. Interestingly, representatives from the air, the, uh, the, the train company were going to go, mm -hmm. but canceled because they said that there is so much tension that they are concerned about their employee safety at a meeting like that. Things have really picked up over the last, last few days with more reports of people feeling ill. Uh, yesterday, for the first time, state officials told people that they should drink bottled water after already telling them it was safe to go back home, and there was no mention of bottled water. That turned things up. And uh, now, even in Washington, there's talk from the area's U.S. senators about a possible congressional investigation of all this. Okay, Ron Allen, a lot of new updates here. Ron, we appreciate it. We turn now to an NBC News exclusive on those high altitude objects the U.S. military has been shooting out of the sky. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin speaking exclusively with our Pentagon correspondent, Courtney Cuby, on the U.S. response to these mysterious objects and growing tensions with China. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin sitting down for his first interview since the U.S. shot down a Chinese spy balloon and then three other flying objects over North America. Has anyone claimed ownership of the last three? No, they haven't. The intelligence community now believes those three objects were not hostile, but Austin defended the recommendation to take them out. The safety and, uh, and security of the American people uh, is always foremost in, in our minds. The decision, he says, made because the objects threatened commercial aviation and may have been collecting intelligence. Objects like these likely over U.S. skies for years, but going undetected. Is this something that the American people have been potentially in danger from for years and just not known it? We don't know if, uh, you know, how frequently these, uh, these things may or may not have have uh, appeared in our airspace. Uh, we're learning a lot more about that. The fact that the U.S. military didn't know about these until recently, is that an intelligence failure? Was that a military failure? No, I, it's, it's, it's how you use your radars. They recently made some adjustments on their, on their radars and opened up the aperture and they're analyzing the data a, a bit differently. Uh, we typically are focused on things that are moving fast and, uh, and uh, it, so it's a bit more difficult to collect on slow-moving objects like a balloon. China today again insisting that its balloon flew over the U.S. accidentally and that in response to new U.S. sanctions, it will, quote, take countermeasures against relevant U.S. entities. Austin acknowledged recent tensions with China have halted communications with his military counterpart. When something happens, they somehow uh, tend to shut down their military channels of communication. I think that's dangerous. Uh, but it won't stop me from continuing to encourage them uh, to open up the lines of communication. I think that's the right thing to do. I asked Secretary Austin if Americans should expect more of these types of objects to be shot down in the near future. And he said the U.S. is still trying to figure out what these first three targets were. And they're working to, to collect the debris so they can determine that definitively. Tom. Now to the ongoing battle in Florida over the new AP American History course. Students and activists protesting today over Governor Ron DeSantis' decision to block the class and his, quote, Stop Woke Act. Sinclair SMY has the latest on the clash there and across the country. 
Tonight, Floridians rallying against Governor Ron DeSantis' Stop Woke Act and his rejection of an advanced placement African-American studies class. We are the people! This is not about fighting each other. This is about fighting to tell all of our stories. That's right. The pilot AP course made headlines in January when the Florida Department of Education rejected the course. The DeSantis administration calling it a vehicle for a political agenda. The governor also restricting some teachings of race and sexuality in public schools. Uh, we want education, not indoctrination. Following DeSantis's ban, the College Board, the designers of the course, released a curriculum without controversy topics called out by the governor. DeSantis now going further, raising the idea of scrapping the educational group's classes altogether. Some of like the top high schools in the country, some of these uh, private schools, they don't do AP. College credit, yes. Having that available for everyone, absolutely. Uh, does it have to be done by the college board or can we utilize some of these other providers? The college board responding to the broader controversy over the weekend, saying in part, quote, we are proud of this course, but we have made mistakes stakes in the rollout that are being exploited. Going on to explain, they quote, deeply regret not immediately denouncing the Florida Department of Education slander. In contrast to Florida, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy announced this week that in his state, the AP African American Studies classes would expand to 26 schools, saying in a press release, quote, as governors like Florida's Ron DeSantis prioritize political culture wars ahead of academic success, New Jersey will proudly teach our kids that black history is American history. This specific AP class, just one of many topics, sparking a national debate about what children are reading and learning across the country. DeSantis referencing a slew of heated school board meetings as well. This is illegal. One such example that made rounds on social media was this school board meeting in Frisco, Texas last November. And she grabbed his with her hands and started moving it. One mother read a graphic passage describing sexual assault from a book she says was in a school library. Finally, she stopped crying because he put his and I don't think you before school board members shut off her mic, you hear the crowd react. Thank you. Survived two attempts. Your time is up. Thank you so much. And there is a, there's a child in our boardroom, so I'd like for you to please stop reading that. <laughs> The book, a popular coming-of-age young adult novel, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. These heated debates continuing as 36 states have introduced 137 bills to restrict teaching on race, gender, and history, according to a PEN America report. Zinclay joins top story tonight. And Zinclay, it seems as these debates continue, the focus is so often on details like that graphic chapter read at the school board meeting or in the case of the AP African-American history course, DeSantis called out sections he thought were inappropriate. A lot of it can just leave parents confused. Tom, you're hitting the crux of a lot of this controversy on its head. Let's start with that excerpt from Perks of Being a Wallflower that we heard read at the school board meeting. The author of that book, Stephen Chopsky, actually has said back in 2015 that he's offended when critics quote passages of the book, but out of context. He adds that those lines are specifically referring to a scene about sexual violence, and he says his response has always been that rape is violence, not sex. That's something he wants parents to understand in the full context. If you look then today at AP African American in history, uh, it's been accused of pushing a political agenda, but the College Board has said in prior statements that their priority is exposing students to multiple perspectives. They want parents to understand that they're taking an intersectional approach to teaching black history. But at this time in history, clearly, Tom, whether in Florida or school board meetings, what we teach and how we teach it remains the source of a lot of controversy. Tom. Okay, Zinclay, thank you for that. Now to power and politics in the 2024 bid for the White House. President Biden has been widely expected to announce his decision after last week's State of the Union. But in an op-ed for the New York Post, Democratic pollster Mark Penn wrote, quote, it's time for Biden to go. Even Democrats think so. Pointing to a recent Associated Press poll that found just 12 percent of Democrats think President Biden should lead the party again. For more on President Biden's 2024 outlook, I want to bring in our panel, NBC News political analyst and CEO of The Dispatch, Stephen Hayes, and Democratic pollster Margie O'Meara. She's a principal at GBAO Strategies. Margie, a lot of polls are showing a similar theme here, right? Democrats aren't thrilled with President Biden. A Washington Post, ABC News poll from earlier this month shows that 58 percent of Democratic voters would rather vote for someone else other than Biden. That's an incredibly troubling number, but it's, it's basically the default, if you think about it, for presidents to run for a second term. Last one who, who didn't was, of course, President Johnson in 1968. If Biden doesn't run again, what happens? Is, is there anybody else right behind him that you think could lead the party and beat a Republican? 
I mean, the action right now are, is on the Republican side. You see a lot of Republican candidates announcing, about to announce. You see polls showing that Republicans are not happy with Trump. You see Trump losing in a rematch with Biden. You see Republican voters feeling DeSantis, who hasn't been tested nationally, uh, preferring him to Trump. So, uh, and Republican donors and establishment folks saying it's time to turn a page. So, Wait, Margie, um, so Margie, I, I ask you about really the Democrats, the though. Is what's happening on the Republicans? I, no, but I assume the so, Democrats. I mean, right if, now, if Biden doesn't Biden, run, who, who do you I'm think? I'm not going to. I can't. Yeah, you can't what? I can't hypothesize about some. There's too many different. You're asking a lot of hypotheticals. I can't hypothesize about uh, what would happen if the president decides not to run again and who else might then have some other decision ahead of them. Right now, the president of the United States is strong. He had a great State of the Union, our dial group, where we ask people across a variety of different uh, partisan persuasions to watch the State of the Union in real time. You saw lots of opportunities for Democrats and Republicans coming together. His favorability increased 20 points among people who sat and watched the State of the Union. You saw people improve in how they felt the country was doing. You saw people improve in how they felt the economy was doing. Their their mood changed. Fewer people said they felt nervous or anxious, that more felt hopeful. So that's from watching Margie, the president no, I, talk about his record I, I and where it. he wants to go next. I get it, and I appreciate that data, but you also have the oldest person to ever deliver a State of the Union address was Joe Biden. You have a special counsel investigation underway right now involving the current president. You also have a president who didn't go through a traditional campaign two years ago because of COVID. So my question to you is, there's a strong possibility he does run for re-election, but there's also a reasonable possibility he doesn't. And if he doesn't, can you name me two or three Democrats you think can take it to the Republicans? I think, you know, I think the entire Democratic bench is strong against what's happening on the other side, because here's what the AP poll that came out today showed that Democrats and Republicans want to see people uh, in Congress co uh, work together to cooperate, to be bipartisan. That's not what Republicans are offering. That's not what DeSantis is offering. It's certainly not what Trump is offering. That's not what Republicans who, you know, are more interested in sort of getting Twitter engagement than in bringing the country together. So I'm, I feel good about the entire Democratic bench. I, I felt great about the midterms where you saw Democrats win handily across the country. And President Biden is, you know, strong in terms of what he's able to accomplish and things that he's been saying about his, about his accomplishments and about his agenda. People support things like the Inflation Reduction Act. They oppose things like a 30 percent everything tax that Republicans are yeah. supporting. So, um, so I feel good about the entire Democratic, from yeah. President Biden to Democrats running around the country. Stephen, I'm going to bring this question to you. Um, you know, polling can sometimes be flawed, right? And we're still a long way out before people start voting in the 2024 cycle. But, but do you see anybody on the Democratic side? We can talk about the vice president. We can talk about Pete Buttigieg. We can talk about Gavin Newsom as well, the governor of California. But do you see anybody else who can, who can sort of unite the party if for some reason President Biden can't run? No, and I think that's part of the reason we're not hearing more about the, the challengers. I think that the Democratic bench is not terribly deep. And in particular, if you look at Kamala Harris's numbers, approval, disapproval, she gets worse marks even than Joe Biden. And as you pointed out, there's a lot of polling that suggests that even Democrats aren't very confident in Joe Biden. I'd just like to push back a little bit on the, the unity theme. You know, there was an NBC poll that we released uh, just a couple of weeks ago that found that Joe Biden's lowest marks came when it when it when uh, respondents were asked about whether he was fostering the kind of unity that he talked about on the campaign trail in 2020 and talked about in his inaugural address and he scored positive remarks from just 23 percent of the people who were surveyed about that the other big question this is the kind of you know the reasons that we have conversations in public among Democratic officials and different conversations in private among Democratic officials. Democrats are worried about Joe Biden's age and his cognitive abilities. This has been widely reported. Jonathan Martin and Alec Spurns had it in their best-selling book uh, less than a year ago. This came up in conversations that I had with senior Democratic officials during the 2020 campaign. And if you look at the marks in that same NBC poll that Joe Biden gets about the ability to, to have the necessary mental and physical health to be an effective president, those numbers are slipping year over year as well, with just 28 percent of respondents saying that they were very confident that Joe Biden could carry out the job. But, and this is a big but, former White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain was asked about this same question in The New Yorker, and here's what he said. 
There's every reason to believe that Donald Trump will be the nominee of the Republican Party in 2024. There's only one person who's ever beaten Donald Trump, and his name is Joe Biden. And the people who have doubts about his candidacy better have a damn good answer for who's going to beat Donald Trump other than Joe Biden. So, Marge, I'm going to come back over to you on this one. How much do you think, because these, you know, both primaries are going to be happening at the same time, how much do you think who the Republicans nominate or who's leading in polls as we start the voting on the Democratic side with Democrats, how much of an influence do you think that's going to have on, on who eventually gets it if it's not Joe Biden? I, I, first of all, as a Democratic pollster, I'll tell you that it's really, you know, I don't want to say it's pointless, but one should not spend too much time thinking about head-to-head -head polls for, you know, for an election that's a long way away. That is, it's simply too far. People, other, you know, the Republican field is not well known. I, I guess my um, question so was, you know what, Mark, really you know what, you know what? okay, let me ask the question a little better because it's better to be specific with you, I think. Yeah. So if, if Donald Trump is the nominee, does that, does that bode better for a Joe Biden uh, re-election campaign? I mean, I think, you know, you were asking two different questions. I think the first question was, do Democratic primary voters look at what's happening on the Republican primary side when they think in their primary? And I, I don't think that that's, that's not really the case. I think people in general look at, you know, the candidate that they're excited about, that, that moves them, rather than think through a variety of different other calculations. As far as whether it helps for Joe Biden to have an opponent in Trump or DeSantis or Haley or Pompeo or whomever else, um, Mike Pence, et cetera, I, you know, I don't know if it, I don't think it really matters. I think, you know, right now, you have Trump really, you know, underwater, n underwater, not doing well with his own party. You have voters in focus groups who say that they voted for Trump, that they like Trump, say, you know, I think the country can't really handle this again. I'm open to somebody else. That's with his base. That's with people who really like him. So I think, you know, it's, whoever it is, um, it's a sign that Trump is vulnerable for sure. But I think the other candidates, when they are out in the national stage and people see that they're just as sort of divisive and, you know, uh, and and one note um, as Trump is, then it's it's we're going to have the same situation. Stephen, does it does it help any Republican candidate in particular if Joe Biden is the nominee if he runs again? You know, that's a good question. I do think um, that it matters a lot for Joe Biden that Donald Trump is the nominee. If if Ron Klain is right and Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, what you saw from Ron Klain there is the single best argument for Joe Biden running again and running unchallenged by other Democrats that you'll hear uh, Joe Biden beat him once. We've seen, if you look at the results from 2022 and 2020, Republicans bleeding support from soft Republican voters and from, in particular, from independents. Joe Biden can make a very strong case, even with the doubts that we've seen expressed in the polls that we've discussed here tonight, that he is the man to beat Donald Trump. He's already done it once. I, I think if, if it's not Donald Trump, I think Joe Biden is pretty vulnerable. If you look at the softness in these numbers, particularly among Democrats, I mean, the numbers among Democrats, uh, whether you're, it's the Washington Post poll, whether it's the AP poll that you cited, those are extraordinary numbers for a sitting commander in chief, a sitting president to have that little enthusiasm among Democrats, particularly after he spent two years, I would say, delivering for Democrats, at least, on many of the policy priorities that, that they were hoping he would deliver on when they elected him. So I think if, if you have that level of enthusiasm going in and Republicans are able to move past Donald Trump and all of the problems that he's brought to the, the party electorally over the past three cycles, yeah, I think Joe Biden would be in real trouble. Stephen, Margie, it has been a pleasure. We thank you both for joining Top Story tonight. Still ahead tonight, the shocking photos from a Miami daycare. Toddlers seen painted in blackface. What? Their parents furious why their teacher says she did it. Plus, the evacuations underway in Arizona tonight after a tanker truck crashed on the highway. Look at this. The dangerous chemicals now lingering in the air. And if you've got a dog, you're going to want to stick around for this one. The major pet food recall just issued will tell you the popular brand affected. You're watching Top Story. We're just getting started on this Wednesday night. Okay, we are back now with some shocking allegations for a Miami daycare. Parents there claiming toddlers were dressed up in blackface and that it was actually done for Black History Month. NBC Stephen Romo has more on the stirring controversy and the response just in from the daycare's owner. We want to warn you some of the images you may find disturbing. 
Tonight, parents outraged at a Miami daycare after toddlers were allegedly seen in blackface for a Black History Month celebration. One mother telling NBC South Florida she got a call from a fellow parent. She's like, you won't believe the photos that were sent to me from this classroom. WTVJ reporting the pictures shared over the school's messaging app appear to show the children in costumes with their faces painted black. I was angry that that somehow that, you know, fell through the crack. And like I said, I wasn't sure how 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 this came about and who 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 decided to do this. But it seemed like it was multiple failures on the school's part. Courtney Politis says she contacted the daycare's owner. When I sent it to the owner and director was like, I'm sorry with a question mark. I don't understand what's racist. We don't use those words. It was her response to me. And the first response is the real response. Politis says the teacher apologized to her and told her painting the children's faces is a cultural tradition in her country of Argentina. It's not an accident. You know better than being, especially being an educator. After the incident, the couple decided to pull their children out of that daycare. What do you make of a claim that this uh, may be just more appropriate or, or just different altogether in a country like Argentina? I mean, it's absolutely not appropriate, right? It is inspired, you know, it is an imitation of U.S. minstrelsy. The racist history of blackface in the United States is well documented, but the offensive practice persists. Philadelphia's Mummers Parade on New Year's Day has for years included some participants in blackface. I talk to black people. They told me, what are you talking about? You can wear whatever you want. That ain't discriminating me. That ain't racist to me. Up until 2020, when those offenders were tossed out of the parade by the mayor. And last year, there was another similar incident with students at a Montessori school in Newton, Massachusetts. A teacher planned and carried out an activity that involved black masks to celebrate Black History Month, according to NBC Boston. Having children participate in an activity in which they draw black faces is shameful. That Massachusetts daycare temporarily closed its doors due to rumors of protests. And that staff member was released from her employment, according to a sign posted on that school's window. We asked the owner of the Miami daycare if the educator at the center of this year's incident was still employed there. She declined to comment, but did add, quote, the truth is going to come out sooner or later. Stephen Romo joins us now in studio. Steve, this story is pretty wild, obviously. Um, the family that first notified everyone about this, they pulled their child out of the daycare. Are they worried it's going to happen again? Yeah, it was actually quite a mess for them to pull the, the child out. The mom said she had to miss a whole week of work. They said they did that. They told NBC South Florida they didn't know what else the school was teaching them. We tried to get more of a response from the daycare as well. They didn't really give us much information. So a lot of questions left about this one, Tom. Okay, Stephen Romo for us. Stephen, thank you for that. Next to the latest bombshell in the legal battle between the families of Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito. The parents of Petito have a major lawsuit claiming the Laundries knew that Brian had murdered Gabby and kept critical information a secret and that they were planning on helping him even flee the country. The latest court documents filed by the Petito family reveals a letter that Brian's mother, Roberta, sent her son. It's marked burn after reading. It goes on to offer him assistance, stating she would, quote, bring a shovel to help bury a body. The Laundries have long maintained they knew nothing about their son, Brian's murder of his fiance, Gabby. I want to bring in NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos and criminal defense attorney Sarah Azari. Guys, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. Uh, Danny, I'm going to start with you. This letter that's been revealed that the lawyers for the Petito family are mentioning, there's no date on this letter, but it sounds incredibly incriminating. Could this be part of the civil lawsuit and could this weigh in on the judgment? Yes. First, it's discoverable. The world of discovery is gigantic compared to that which is actually ultimately admissible in court. And it's probably ultimately admissible in court. I can see a judge saying, hey, this is something that, hey, mom can come on the stand. She can explain it. She can say, I wrote that before they ever set out in their van trip. Fine. But it's a fact issue for the jury to ultimately determine. So in all likelihood, it's discoverable and it comes in. But is it that incriminating? I'm not so sure. If I'm defense counsel, and this case goes to trial, maybe I argue, look, 
Yes, she said she would bring a shovel, but did she in fact bring a shovel? This case is about the emotional distress that allegedly the Laundry family caused. She, if she wrote a letter, irrespective of when she wrote, you can believe she wrote it after the fact that they went out on their trip. She never actually showed up with that shovel and never actually buried a body. So the probative value of it is a bit questionable. Don't, don't get me wrong. It still comes in. It's still something for the jury to consider, and it does not make the laundries look all that great. On that, Sarah, if you were defending the laundries right now, if you were their attorney and you had to deal with this letter, right, you could argue, as Danny just mentioned, it was written before. That's what they're arguing now. There's no date on it. She was joking. But it's that type of language being used, and now you have a young woman who died. Um, maybe even this, if this happened prior to it, but it doesn't look like, it doesn't make the laundry parents look, I would say, um, clean, if you will, right? It makes, him, it makes him look a little bit suspect, as in if you would write this letter even jokingly, what else did you help him do, and did you know that, that he had already killed her when the FBI was searching? Right, and I think, to, to, look, to Danny's point, discovery leads to more discovery, right? You get this letter, you then set up the deposition of the mother, find out when this was written, when it was sent to her son, or when did she give it to her son, uh, and, and that's where you can start to develop the theory of admissibility. It becomes more and more relevant, or maybe less and less relevant. But the the idea here is that we're talking about intentional inflection, infliction of emotional distress. Right. Uh, the Petito family was on every network. You could visibly see their distress. Right. And uh, the Laundry family, through their attorney, yeah. was on every network, sort of uh, denying knowing anything, denying ha not having any information. And not responding to the Petitos when they were texting. And not responding yeah. to them. And by virtue of not being silent, you know, and, and again, through their lawyer not being silent, yeah. they really put themselves in the middle of this lawsuit. I think if they had not said anything through their lawyer, they may not have even had a duty, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's why this lawsuit didn't get kicked out last year when it was first brought and it was fought and, you know, they yeah. wanted to kick it out and, and it, it, it stayed because of the, their actions. Dave, do you think they have a case here? Does the Petito family have a case? Do you think they could possibly win this civil lawsuit? If I'm guessing, and I'm almost always wrong when I predict the outcome of these cases, <laughs> no. but I would predict <laughs> that this case does not succeed, and here's why. why. You absolutely have damages. You have damages of the worst kind. You have a family that is devastated by the loss of their child. But to use Sarah's word, she used the magic word, and it's duty. Even if the parents knew what their son did, even if they were aware of it and they failed to open their mouths and announce it to the world, they didn't necessarily violate a duty to Gabby's family by doing that. Just as if there is no duty for us to generally go out there and announce that people right. are committing crimes. In fact, there are a lot of reasons why that isn't a good idea to start announcing that randomly. So here, I think where the case fails, is showing that the laundry, the laundry family had a duty to the Petitos to come forward and say, hey, we know things about our son. They absolutely have the damages, the worst kind of damages. I don't know that they can prove their theory of liability. Before, and before we go, Sarah, but because we, we don't have enough time, um, I do want to ask you about attorney-client privilege. Mm -hmm. if, if the laundry family attorney knew something, does he have to tell police or does he not have to tell police if it involves a crime? Uh, well, there's a crime exception to the attorney-client privilege. So Explain that to me. Communications between a client and their lawyer or clients and their lawyer is privileged. There are exceptions. One of them is if it's regarding a crime, a crime being committed or a crime having been committed and then they're obstructing justice or whatnot. So that they would have, that would be a waiver. So the, the lawyer's not protected. But remember, the lawyer's also being dragged into this lawsuit. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah but it's on the civil side. Right. You know, they've been cleared on the, on the FBI side. I think there was an investigation and they had this letter and they determined, yeah. even though we don't know the date, that it was not incriminating and, and they were cleared. Uh, but I think to Danny's point, that's where you look at the strengths and weaknesses of a case and you might write a check, even if you think at trial it's not going to be a go. Uh, but that's where you look at, at how a jury would view this and would you prevail or not. You might just write that check just to make it go away. Okay, if you have the money. Okay, yeah. guys, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Coming up next, the Ozempic Confessions. From weight gain to headaches to nausea, how the injection impacted three patients who went on the popular weight loss drug, and what doctors want you to know before going on that medication. Stay with us.
All right, we're back now with Top Stories news feed. Evacuations tonight in Arizona after a truck carrying toxic chemicals crashed near Tucson. New video shows nitric acid fumes leaking from the truck on Interstate 10. The chemical can cause severe skin burns, eye damage. It can be deadly if inhaled. Residents within half a mile radius were evacuated, and those within a mile are urged to turn off heaters or air conditioners. No word on what caused that crash, but the driver was killed. And a popular brand of dog food is being recalled over concerns it may cause kidney failure in pets. Purina says this pro-plan prescription dry dog food may contain elevated levels of vitamin D. The food is prescription only and distributed by vets. Elevated levels of vitamin D can lead to several health issues, including kidney failure, and we know at least two dogs now have been sickened by this. Turning now to the latest on Ozempic, the diabetes drug now being used by many for weight loss. Some women who use the drug now opening up about what happened when they stopped taking it. Vicki Wynn has more on their stories and some of the side effects they experienced. I wanted pizza, a lot of empty carbs. I gained some weight that I lost back. Everything that you took it to hide comes back. Those cravings, everything. Three women sharing their stories about life on Ozempic. Shea Murray is a single mom and type 2 diabetic. Ebony Wiggins also has diabetes, and Danielle Baker, who was prescribed the drug to lose weight. Even though the company says it's not a weight loss drug, two of the three women did lose some pounds, an outcome mentioned in the ads. Oh, up to 12 pounds. Part of that weight loss comes from the way Ozempic works. It mimics a hormone that makes you feel full longer, reduces food cravings, and suppresses your appetite. How did you feel about food when you were on Ozempic? Didn't even think of it. it. Looking at a bag of Doritos was kind of looking at a pair of socks. Shay says if she overate, she would feel nauseated, a side effect Ebony also had. No matter how little I seem to eat in that sitting, I would get nauseous or I would throw it up. So I definitely ate less. I just didn't feel good. Even just drinking water would kind of upset my stomach and make me feel a little nauseous. While not everyone experiences side effects, Danielle says in addition to the daily nausea, she also felt constant headaches. The discomfort made her stop taking Ozempic after three months. She says she didn't expect what happened next. Everything came back full force, right? Like the, all the crazy cravings that I've struggled with for the sweets, the junk food. Felt like I was overcompensating. Danielle's weight didn't drop. She says she gained eight pounds while on Ozempic. And after stopping, her weight climbed 20 pounds. Shea says she hoped Ozempic would put her type 2 diabetes into remission. But after two and a half months, her insurance coverage changed and she lost access to the drug. What happened when you stopped taking Ozempic? For the first, I'd say, week and a half, you still had that numbness to food cravings. And then suddenly it was like your body woke up and discovered, hey, I like bread. <laughs> she says she has to fight the urge to eat and is working extra hard to control her weight and diabetes. So this is, so is not like a magic pill. You still have to work at exercise and knowing your portion control. I was on Ozempic for about six months. Ebony experienced nausea and vomiting while on the drug, but together with diet and exercise, she lost 25 pounds. She stopped taking Ozempic because it became too hard to get. Her appetite also came roaring back. You could say that I appreciated eating a little too much. If you are looking to lose weight, there are other drugs to talk to your doctor about, including Wagovi, Saxenda, and Contrave. Unlike Ozempic, those medicines are all currently FDA approved for weight loss. Back to you. We thank our friend Vicki Wynn for that. With drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi becoming more popular, what do patients need to know about the long-term effects? I want to bring in NBC News medical contributor and a friend to Top Story, Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, thanks so much for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier. Everyone is talking about this. Yes. Our viewers have seen probably 15 stories about Ozempic because yes. it is so popular. Yes. But I think people need to be educated about it. And, and I guess the reality that, that we're learning from Vicki's story and from, you know, just anecdotally is that people are gaining weight if they stop with yeah. the injections? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the pharmacologic effect of the drug, i.e. the way it's working in the body, 
to treat diabetes and to result in that weight loss, that effect only lingers for about three to four weeks after the medication is stopped. It's not, you know, we wish we could in medicine give people an antidepressant for four weeks and suddenly reset your brain and you're no longer depressed. And the same would be said for this, that you take Ozempic, you take Wagovi, and after you stop the medication, somehow your metabolic, you know, um, uh, control centers have been reset so that you no longer need to need, need these drugs. But that's not the way it works. You know, the medications work incredibly well to treat diabetes. They also work to, to, um, to treat overweight or obesity. They slow what's called gastric emptying, so they slow down how quickly the food is leaving your stomach, and they also hit that fullness center in the brain, so you feel more quickly and you eat less. But sometimes, I mean, it takes three to four weeks to create a habit, right? Yeah. And if you're on Ozempic and usually you eat a turkey sandwich, yeah. and now you're seeing that when you take Ozempic, you can only eat half the sandwich. Yeah. What happens when you when you come off? You, you're going to want to eat the whole sandwich again? Yeah, so the thing is that, you know, it's like like a lot of things in medicine. It's, it's not just a, a straightforward thing where it's just about appetite, but it also has to do with cravings. You know, a lot of people who, who are on Ozempic or Wagovi just have a different desire for food. And they're, some of them are really just eating because they know they have to. Like, right. they really lose that. And then once that's gone, suddenly you're like, wow, you know, I really want to have a bagel or I really want to have that bowl of pasta. And when you have a craving, that strong. You know, we've all been in that situation, but for folks who are overweight or, or obese, those cravings over time, obviously, can be really problematic. And so doctors should be having this conversation with their patients that are taking it strictly for weight loss, that listen, once you come off this, and right. it's not cheap, right. once you come off this, you may gain the weight back. Right. And you know, listen, for, for the obesity medicine specialists and endocrinologists who are treating patients with type 2 diabetes, they're not experiencing this kind of yo-yoing with patients going on it just for a cosmetic reason and then stopping it. These medications are meant to be taken for a long period of time. You start with a very low dose and increase the dose very slowly. And coming off of it, they likely do the same thing and sort of taper more slowly so that people don't have that kind of like, you know, rubber band effect. But I think an important point to make to our viewers as we've been trying to communicate over the last couple of weeks is that this isn't for people who need to lose five or 10 pounds. This is for people who either have type two diabetes in the case of Ozempic or who are obese or overweight. And it works for those two groups and it works in a healthy way. A hundred percent. I mean, and that, you know, we've come to understand that overweight and obesity is a disease. Um, it is not just behavioral. There are a lot of genetic and, and other factors that contribute to the inability to lose weight. And these folks need it and they benefit dramatically from the medications, which is why we were so concerned about the shortages. Yeah. But like any drug, Tom, there are potential side effects. Of course, even in obese and overweight individuals, there could be non and constipation and rarer side effects of, of pancreatic, uh, you know, pancreatitis and, and kidney problems. So it's not a free lunch, yeah. um, you know, no pun intended, um, but, you know, it really should be done under the guidance of a provider who knows what they're doing. And real quick, it's become so popular, it's still very expensive. Oh Prices gosh. haven't come down? Roughly $1,000 without insurance a month. Okay. No, that yeah. is incredibly expensive. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Natalie Azar, it's been a minute. It's great to have you back on Top Story. We appreciate it. Okay, coming up, a cyclone slams New Zealand. Homes flooded, thousands forced to flee. Look at these images. We'll have the latest on the path of destruction left in Gabrielle's wake. That's next. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch, and we start in Western Panama and a deadly bus crash. New video shows the wreckage of the bus after it fell off a cliff carrying dozens of migrants. Nearly 40 people killed and roughly 20 others injured in this horrific crash. It's still unclear whether the mi where the migrants were from, but authorities say they had already traveled through the dangerous Darien Gap. And we're getting a look at the trail of devastation left behind by Cyclone Gabrielle. New aerial footage shows the massive flooding on New Zealand's east coast. Some homes, you see them here, submerged up to their roofs. The powerful storm leaving at least four people dead so far and forcing about 9,000 from their homes. That does it for us. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.